Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Oasis Church. Whether you are here or joining us online, it is such a joy to be able to gather freely together. We read in Hebrews 1 verse 3, that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What a glorious picture this scripture has painted of Jesus. The same God who controls and created the universe is the same God who would love and forgive us. So how else can we respond but with joyful singing? Let's stand and sing of his loving kindness. Jesus now awake the dawn will greet your mercy with a song. Your people stand and sing for all your loving kindness. You carried us in faithfulness upon the clouds of righteousness. Our gracious King, you crowned us with.
hands hold to the Savior. We are alive for your praise in earth and sky. No one is higher. to see the church welcoming one another. It's so wonderful that we can gather. Welcome from me as well. My name is Emma, I'm part of the team here. And kids, for those of you who are in the service, it's wonderful to have you. A couple more weeks and you'll be back at Oasis Kids Ministries. I myself have been away for a few weeks with the family and we had a wonderful time away, but I'm so happy to be back with the church family. I know as well that um, some of our young adults, they're back from their time at convention, which is our biannual um, denomination time away together. So you can see photos here of the Oasis friends that went and then the whole group. And Nathaniel, who was one of the key leaders and organizers said that it was a great time. Highlights included how everyone connected with each other and with the messages and response that God was very clearly at work. We praise God for that, hey? At Oasis, we exist to help more people find life in Jesus. And if you are new and you would like to find out more about our church, please make sure you grab a welcome pack from the Connection Centre. And we'd also like to extend an invitation to anyone who may have been visiting for a little while. Um, if you'd like to connect with us more or find out more about Oasis, please join us for Connect Coffee after the service. So Ben, our community pastor, and some of the team will be there out at the park. The doors over there outside, the Connect Coffee will run. At Oasis, an important part of practicing life together, one of our priorities, life together, is in growth groups. And if you're part of a group like I am, I'm sure that you're looking forward to the upcoming series that's starting on the 29th of January. 
And if you've perhaps been thinking or wondering if you could or should join a growth group, we want to encourage you to take a step and to do that this term. On the 29th, as I said, we'll be starting a series called Sermon on the Mount, following Jesus in a fallen world. And in growth groups, you can study God's Word together and dig that bit deeper. So if you'd like to find out more, you can scan the QR code that's in front of you. You can head to the Connection Centre after the service or email ben, ben at oasischurch.com.au to find out more. Here at Oasis, we believe that regular, joyful and sacrificial giving is an act of worship and an offering of thanks to God who has so generously given to us in Jesus. Now we know and we're so grateful for many that give online. If you'd like to give while you're here today, you can use one of the giving boxes in the auditorium. There's FPOS at the Connection Centre, or of course you can jump online. Our annual summer party is coming up in a few weeks. Kids, do you remember? Do you love the summer party where we meet and afterwards we have even more food than normal and we enjoy time together? It's coming up on the 29th of January. We'll gather together at 9 a.m. So just one morning service that day, 9 a.m. and also 6 p.m. We will together pray for the continued year ahead. We'll pray for the staff and the elders and deacons. So please plan to come along and then stay afterwards as well. And as I mentioned to you wonderful children, on that day, on the 29th at 9am, make sure you remind mum and dad, 9am, Oasis Kids will kick back as well. For those of you who are new, we run Oasis Kids on Sundays during the school term. There's Junior Kids Church and Kids Church. Fortnightly, we have a high school program for year seven, eight and nine that run during the school term as well, as well as the many kids and youth ministries that happen during the week. So that will kick off after the week of the 29th. There'll be information in the quarterly. You can jump online and find out more about that as well. If you have little ones in the service with you, they are so welcome. If you need to make use of the parents' room, it's through the foyer on the left at the moment. Our amazing tech team are doing all they can. We have an audio feed, but not a live feed at the moment. So you can head there if you need to make use of that. Now, before we pray together, how about we listen to these words that are found in Philippians chapter four. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together, friends. And Heavenly Father, we, we do, we rejoice in you, for you are good and faithful merciful and, and gracious. We've just sung of your loving kindness, God. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. We thank you for the children who are here and we pray for them, Lord. We ask that you will guard their hearts, that you will show them your ways. We pray, Lord, that these children will follow and serve you, that they will know you. And as they step into kids' ministry in, in the future weeks, Lord, we pray for those who minister to them, for those who serve on the kids' teams, that you will bless them, that you will equip them, that you will give them the energy and the right motive. Lord, we thank you for these beautiful children. We thank you for marriages, Lord, and we pray that you will show us how to be loving and forgiving, Lord, that you will protect relationships. Show us how to reflect your love in the way that we love one another. Lord, as we meet in growth groups and serving teams and all the many other ways, we pray that you will give us a deep love for one another, that we will care for one another, Lord, that we will pray for one another. Lord, we too thank you for the money that has been given. And we ask that you will help us to be wise with all that you have given us. Help us and show us how to follow your example, Jesus, that we will be generous in all that you have given us, our time, our treasures, Lord. And God, for those in our church family who are in a difficult place, 
as we read in your word, we pray that your peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Help us not to be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving in our hearts, let our requests be known to you. And Lord, by your spirit, guide our thoughts, our hearts, our words. And as we hear from your word soon, we pray that you will give us an ear to hear and a soft and humble heart to receive. May your kingdom come and will be done, we pray. And as we worship you in song now, as we sing the truths of who you are and of what you have done, give us a fresh and new understanding, a revelation, Lord, of your kindness and your mercy. And may our response be reverent worship to you alone, for you are worthy, Lord. And we pray this in your mighty name, Jesus. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and continue worshipping now.
submit ourselves to you now. In this shifting and tumultuous world, we know that we can find our hope and security in you. In the valleys and in the hills, you are there. And we pray that this is the truth we not only proclaim but cling to. Father, soften our hearts so that your word would edify and convict us this morning. We rest in your promises. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Please turn with me to Haggai chapter 2. We're going to read verses 10 through to 19. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a vine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, 
give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought, is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. This is the word of the Lord. Um, borrow Ansolette's microphone because uh, this snapped off when I sat up from my seats. <laughs> if one of the tech guys could fix this, I'll just use the handheld for now. Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Uh, yeah, good to see you all. It's good that we're just brothers and sisters, and I can just be honest that I'm a bit clumsy at times. It's great to have Ansolette read the Bible for us. Thank you so much, Hados. And I um, I wanted to start this morning by reading to you an article that I read online this week. It's written by a lady called Beth Clay. She's a Christian. She's writing on the Gospel Coalition, and this is something she wrote. She said, I'd considered myself a Christian for as long as I could remember, but somewhere along the way, my faith had faded into spiritual complacency. While I had no desire to walk away from my faith, the place I ended up was almost worse. I just didn't care. I was going through some of the motions, church attendance and occasional prayer, but lacked any kind of spiritual interest or fervor. I only thought about God when I felt that he had let me down in some way. Now, I think a lot of Christians can relate to Beth's experience there, at least at some point in their Christian journey. Thank you so much, Hados. Might just quickly change this over. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so Beth was just writing about how she went through this spiritual complacency. I think a lot of us can relate to that in some ways. Sometimes in our faith, we we feel this complacency. Maybe we're going through the motions still. Maybe we're still coming along on a Sunday, or maybe we're busy serving, or maybe we're still part of a growth group. But there's this spiritual complacency. Our heart has drifted from God. Our heart isn't as warm to God as it once was. And maybe people looking at you might even be able to say that you look like a model Christian because of how busy you are doing stuff for Jesus. But when they really dig dig down a bit further, you would say that you don't feel a connection with God. Your heart is far from him. Now, sometimes that's not our fault. Maybe God has us in a season where we feel this, this disconnection. He's testing our faith to see if we'll base our beliefs on his word and not on our feelings. Sometimes it is our fault. It's a sin issue in our life that's blocking that connection with God. But what's really dangerous is if we make a conclusion that God just wants our efforts instead of our hearts, that he's okay with us just going through the motions without our heart really being in it. What's really dangerous is when we conclude that doing stuff for God is enough, that's acceptable. That he just wants our Sunday and a bit of service rather than our whole life devoted to him. Now, the reason I can say that's dangerous is because this is what God confronts his people about in our passage this morning. He comes along and he confronts his people with this very issue. You see, they were busily serving God. They were building his temple as they should. But that wasn't enough. Their hearts were far from God. They didn't love God, even though they were building his temple. They thought he wanted their efforts, but he wanted their hearts. They thought building the temple was all God wanted. But God didn't just want them to do a task. He wanted them to be his people. Now, the reason that we're looking at Haggai's message today is because we're in a series right now called First Things First, the message of Haggai. We started it two weeks ago, so we're in week three now. And in the first week, we opened up chapter one and we saw that God came along and he confronted his people because they'd stopped rebuilding the temple. They'd stopped for 10 years and God kind of wakes them up and says, get back to work, get back to build. What's going on? Why are you building your own houses and leaving my house dilapidated, my temple in ruins? And the people to their credit repented and they began to build. But then in chapter two, we saw that they were in a month into the building work and they began to just get discouraged. They began to feel like the work they were doing was futile. It was just so pitiful, this new temple compared to what it once was. It seemed like, what's the point? And God came along and said, I'm with you, be strong, keep working, and I'm going to bless you in the future. And now this week, God comes along to his people 
And he says that he doesn't simply want them to build the temple. Their issue is always deeper than just their neglect of a task. He wants their whole hearts. I think all of us tend to fall into this at some degree or another at some point in our Christian journey. We realize at times that we might be going through the motions a bit. And so I think it's a good time for us today, for all of us to consider where is our relationship with Jesus? Not how often am I coming along on a Sunday necessarily, but where is my heart with Jesus? Where's my connection with God? How am I going in that relationship? Do I love God? Or am I kind of just sort of plowing along through the motions? If you're not a Christian here this morning, I'm so glad you're here. You're welcome here to be with us. And this is going to be helpful for you too, because you're going to see what God really wants from you. He doesn't want you to add a little bit of religion to your life. He wants your whole life. He wants your whole heart. He wants you to know him. He wants each day to be spent walking in a connection with him. He wants you to see your whole life as a life of worship to him. So we're going to dive in and we're going to find out how God deals with this issue in Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 to 19. And we'll look at the passage under three headings. And the first heading is this, a question about holiness in verses 10 to 13. I'll just read verses 11 to 13 for us again. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If someone carries consecrated or holy meat in the fold of their garment, and if that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? Does it become holy? The priests answered, no. If it touches bread or if it touches olive oil, does it make those things holy? Verse 13, then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Okay, so this is like completely random to most of us, I think. We're like, what is going on here? What is Haggai getting at? And we have to dive back into the book of Leviticus to kind of understand what he's drawing from. And the book of Leviticus is the book of holiness, And one of the key verses that God has in that book is be holy. He says to his people, be holy as I am holy. So let's just quickly understand what does that word holy mean? In our culture, in our day and age, sometimes we use it to refer to someone who's smug and thinks they're better than others. They're holier than thou. Sometimes in Christian circles, I think we use it just to refer to moral righteousness. Someone says, I want to be more holy. They're saying, I want to be more righteous. But actually, holiness is bigger than just moral righteousness. Holiness, when we talk about God as holy, refers to his specialness, that he is set apart, that he is in a special category of his own. So that would include his moral righteousness, but that includes everything that makes God, God. His all powerfulness, his eternal nature. He is holy. And when he says to his people, be holy as I'm holy, he's saying, be set apart, be distinct, be special, be my treasured possession. And they can only do that in human ways. Obviously, he's not saying, be all-powerful, be eternal. They can't do that. But he outlines in the book of Leviticus what it looks like for them to be holy. And then there's different laws. There's lots of moral laws. But there's also laws to do with uncleanness, with ritual uncleanness. And these laws are what Haggai is really drawing from. These laws sometimes, well, they don't really have anything to do with moral issues. Sometimes they do a little bit. But mostly what they have to do with is the fact that we as fallen people live in a fallen, corrupt, broken world affected by death. And how can we, contaminated with this sort of death and corruption, just go into God's presence, his holy presence, and worship him? So we need to be clean before we can go in. That's what it's kind of concerned with. And so what Haggai does in these verses, he he asks some questions to set as an illustration to kind of get at the people's issue. So what he does is he says, okay, if some meat's holy, it's dedicated to the Lord. If it touches other items, does it make them holy? No. If someone is defiled, they're unclean, they've touched a dead body, and they go and touch these things, does it make them defiled? Does it make them unclean? Yes. The point is, uncleanness is much more contagious than cleanness. It's kind of like COVID, if I could use that as an illustration. So COVID, it's very contagious. If you're sitting in the same room as someone breathing the same air, you can possibly catch it. But healthiness is not contagious. 
doesn't matter how healthy someone is or how close they are to someone with COVID, the person with COVID can't catch healthiness from them. It's not contagious. And that's the same sort of way this works. The uncleanness is kind of, has a defiling sort of polluting influence. And so Haggai says, okay, so we know how this works, right? That's how it works. And then he goes on in the next section to show the people their need for holiness with this answer. So this is the second section, their need for holiness. And this is what Haggai says in verse 14. He says, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there in that temple precinct is defiled. Okay. So Haggai is saying, God saying through Haggai, that these people are like someone who's touched a corpse, they're defiled, and they're going in and they're doing all of God's work, building the temple, and it's, everything's defiled. They might think that because they're doing a holy task, the temple's holy, they're touching the stones, maybe they, they, they might think the holiness is almost rubbing off on them in some way, as if God's pleased with them because they're doing a holy task. But God is saying, no, 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 it works the other way around, we know this, because you're unacceptable in my sight, you're, you're unclean, you're defiling everything, everything you're doing is, is defiled. So even though they should have been building the temple, which was good, it seems as if we, as we look at this text, they were unclean in a sense, that's just an illustration to say they weren't right before God. Their hearts weren't in it. They didn't love God with all their heart, soul, mind and strength. They were doing a task that he wanted them to do but because they weren't right with God, because their hearts weren't in it, it's like they're the unclean people carrying their uncleanness into all their work they're doing. And so God wants them to think about this. He wants them to consider this. And so he asks them later on in verses one to five, if we can just, oops, sorry, actually, skip foot. Yeah, in verses 15 to 19, he, he asks them to give careful thoughts. We'll read those together. Now give careful thought, that's a command, that's why it's underlined, to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. So God says it again and again, doesn't he? You see those commands repeated. Give careful thought. Think about this. I want you to reflect on what's going on. Think a bit more deeply. Before the temple was even built, the situation wasn't great for you guys. You were under my judgment. You went to a heap of 20 measures, it was 10. You went to a wine vat and it was hardly full. You were under my judgment. But even now, think about what's going on. Is the storehouse yet full? No. Have these trees, it says at the very end, pomegranate, those sorts of things, have they yet borne fruit? No. So in other words, you haven't thought deeply enough. You, your repentance is not yet complete. I didn't just want you to build the temple. That's good. I wanted you to return to me. I wanted your whole heart. I wanted you to be my people, a holy people. That's what God's getting at in this passage. You see, it's possible to serve God and to be busy even for God without giving him your heart. And that's what the people were doing here. And this is what I mean by their need for holiness, their dire need for holiness. God wanted his people to be set apart for him, to be a holy people, to be a special people. Their problem was so much deeper than just needing to build the temple. They needed to set themselves apart for God. They needed to be holy. And so just let me ask you this morning, where are you at in your relationship with God? Where's your heart? You know, you might be doing Christian things. You might be serving in the children's ministry and serving others and working hard, but maybe if you were honest with yourself, your, your prayer life has dried up. There's not a, you don't talk to God much. Or maybe you're, you come along every Sunday and you sign up to serve, or you're at every event that's going on, but if you're honest, your, your Bible reading is been really sh has been shortened and it just feels dry and it's just a task to tick off for the day. Where, where are you at 
Maybe you're busy doing Christian stuff, but where's your heart? Where's your relationship with God at? You see, there was a church in the New Testament that had this problem, that they'd lost their first love. They were hard workers. They had a really solid understanding of God's word, but they were in danger of losing their status as a church because they had stopped loving God. And this is how Jesus spoke to them in Revelation 2. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. I'll remove your status as a church from before me. And as you consider your relationship with God, if you've realized that you've fallen away from that first love, Jesus wants you to come back to him. Jesus wants you to think about what you did when you had that love and to do those things again. He doesn't want you to come back to give you a scolding. He actually wants to come back to bless you, to come back so he can bless you. And this is actually the surprising response of God in the final section of our passage. We've looked at a question about holiness and the dire need for holiness, but then we look at the response, the surprising response of holiness. Look at how holy God responds to their lack of holiness in the last line. He did confront them, but then he ends with this, verse 19, from this day on, I will bless you. From this day on. Now, this isn't what we expect. This is surprising. This is a little bit like if, if, if there's a couple, they're in love, and, and the man slowly drifts away from his lover. His heart slowly drifts away from her. He becomes distant. He becomes cold. He starts to not connect with her. and He still has a care for her, but it's, their relationship is going dry. And, and this woman, she's hurt, and she, and she decides she's going to confront him about it. And so she, she speaks to him, and she outlines the ways that he's disconnected and her confusion and how this has hurt her. And he's just bracing himself for impact. He's ready for her to cut things off here. But then she ends with this. She says, and so from this day forward, I'm going to love you even more deeply. I'm going to think about how I can bless you from this day on. Now, wouldn't that be surprising? Wouldn't that just melt his heart? This is a picture of what God is doing in this passage. We don't even hear that the people respond yet. They don't, don't even know if they had a chance to respond. God just says, I'm going to bless you from this day on. That's who God is. His heart is just full of generosity, full of grace, full of kindness, full of love, full of unconditional love. This is how a holy God responds. God's holiness doesn't mean he's stingy. God's holiness refers to how he's a category above the rest of us. He's so unlike us. In our sinfulness, sometimes it makes us self-focused. But the holy God chose to come down and take on human flesh and die in the place of sinners. In our sinfulness, sometimes it makes us operate on a lower plane, sort of a tit-for-tat basis with other people. But the holy God loves and blesses undeserving people even his enemies. God is so unlike us. He is holy. And ultimately, God's desire to bless sinners came to fruition in Jesus. Jesus came into our world. He was God's strategy to bless the world. And something happened in Jesus' ministry that had never happened before. Look at Matthew chapter 8 with me. It says, When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came. This man's unclean, according to Leviticus. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him. Okay, so that's a bit close. You're going to make Jesus unclean almost in a second. And said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. See, something happened that had never happened before. Usually the unclean defiled the clean. 
But here the clean one, the holy one, Jesus, made this unclean man clean. He didn't just heal him of his disease, he made him clean. He, he made it possible for him to come back into the temple and to worship with God's people and to relate with God again. It's incredible. The holy God responds to his people's unholiness by blessing them. And Jesus made an eternal cleansing available for us at the cross. See, this is why he submitted himself to so many things that would be unclean and horrifying for Jewish people. He didn't just touch people affected by death. He didn't just even raise people from the dead, but he went through death himself. And he was buried in a tomb, which is so associated with death, that was totally an unclean place. Jesus went through all of that and he rose again and he conquered death. And he made a cleansing for our sins at the cross so that he offers, can offer life and cleansing and holiness to all those who trust in his invincible cleansing power. If you're here today and you're considering Jesus, you're not sure about Jesus, take note of what this means. Jesus isn't asking you to clean yourself up before you can come to him. He's made a cleansing available for you at the cross. He wants you to come as you are, warts and all, so that he can cleanse you and he can give you a new life in him. Maybe you're a Christian, but you feel unholy in your heart. You, you feel like it's not really fully set apart for him. It's divided. You don't fully love him. What will help you get back on track? Well, maybe it's getting to know the real Jesus again. Maybe it's just getting to know God. Remember that article I read to you at the beginning by Beth Clays? She was feeling far from God. She didn't care about him. Well, she shares with us how she found her way back to God. This is how she finishes her article. During my mum's illness and subsequent death, I experienced faith deconstruction and reconstruction. I carefully examined the things I said I believed while acknowledging that if I were honest, I didn't live as if they were true. I knew I should trust God, but I struggled to believe that he was good to me, that he knew what was best for me, and that he had the right to direct me in how I should live. As I wrestled through these questions, I realized one reason I didn't trust God was that I didn't know him. I knew some things about him and who he was supposed to be, but those truths had become distant to me and disconnected from the reality of my life. I knew God was love, but what did that really mean? Why was life so painful at times if he loved me? I knew God was good, but what definition of good? Sometimes he didn't feel good to me. The knowledge I had of God lacked depth. I couldn't answer my own questions about what I believed. God was gracious to me in that journey, giving me a hunger to pursue him and spend time in his word. I realized how impossible it is to trust someone you don't know. How could I trust God's goodness if I didn't even know what that meant? I began approaching the Bible with a simple question. What does this passage tell me about who God is? Asking God to help me know and understand him better as I read the Bible slowly became part of my daily habit. My confidence in God grew as my mind continually turned toward the truth about who he is. The challenges I had felt in trusting him began to slowly fade because I knew him. His word became the great revealing of himself to me. And as I poured my heart out to him in prayer, a real deep and meaningful relationship slowly formed. Do you know God? He wants you to know him. And maybe like Beth, you've come to a point where you've realized there's a spiritual complacency in your life. If that's you, then maybe you could just start by opening up the Bible and asking regularly what it teaches you about him. When you're feeling distant from God, the answer is not to build the temple faster, to get more busy necessarily. It's to, the answer is to draw near to the one you're disconnected from. It's getting to know the holy God who blesses unholy people. And when you experience the real God, his majesty and kindness, your heart will be warmed and desire will be awakened. And you will just find yourself becoming more devoted to him, more set apart for him, more living in line with the holiness he's gifted to you at the cross. So let's pray and let's ask God to do that for all of us. Pray. 
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is your voice to us, that you you have spoken to us today. And Lord, I want to thank you for my brothers and sisters who do feel that their heart is with you, that they're walking in relationship with you, and we thank you for them, and we pray that you'd encourage them in that. But Lord, we want to pray for those this morning who feel disconnected from you, who would acknowledge that they've been running through the motions. And Father, we just ask that you would reveal yourself to them, that you would show them more of who you are, that you would stir up in their hearts a holy desire to seek you, to know you, to read your word. And Lord, we pray that as they do that, that they will just experience you and encounter you and be surprised by how good and how wonderful and how glorious you are. Lord, we pray, capture our hearts, capture the heart of this church. We wanna be a people set apart for you, a people that belong to you. We thank you that you purchased us at the cross, Jesus, that you've adopted us into your family, that you have cleansed us through the blood that you shed. And we pray that we can live in line with all that you've done all the days of our lives. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Church, would you stand with us, please? We're going to continue worshiping through singing. Let me ask God to bless you with these words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. May God himself, the God of peace, make you holy through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
also connect coffee for those who are interested in membership have a wonderful week we'll see you next sunday god bless